with his reaction to Beijing's move. We're now joined by Henri Paul Normandin, Canada's former ambassador to the United Nations, who also worked for several years in China. Ambassador, thank you for being with us this evening. Pleased to join you. So China is, as you know, promising to retaliate further beyond the expulsion of this one Canadian diplomat. What else might Beijing do here? Well, I think that Beijing will have to weigh its options. On the one hand, as we know, China has a very, conducts a very aggressive diplomacy. So it is in the realm of possibilities that it may want to retaliate in terms of uh, commercial links with Canada. You know, they might find some problem with our canola or our pork. Uh, not impossible as well that they may keep an eye on some Canadians in, uh, in China. So that is a possibility, but this being said, I noted in China's reaction when they expelled the, the Canadian diplomat uh, earlier today that they said to Canada, stop your quote-unquote uh, provocations. Uh, if not, we might retaliate further. So that might be a sign that China will stop there. Because in terms of considering their options, you know, if they impose economic sanctions, it also hurts them at the time when China's economy is not going so well. Secondly, it brings the international spotlight on this incident. It is a little bit embarrassing for China to see one of its diplomats expelled for reasons of interference at a time when many countries complain about interference by China. So if they decide to escalate this issue, it will shed more spotlight on the issue. So I think China will have to weigh the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Weigh the pros and cons, as you say. You mentioned monitoring Canadians uh, in China. I'm, wo I'm wondering if Canadian nationals need to be worried if they are in the PRC or in Hong Kong. And when I ask that, I'm thinking, of course, about the two Michaels uh, being arrested when Canada carried out that extradition request for Meng Wanzhou. I wouldn't go as far as saying that Canadians in China or Hong Kong are in danger. Uh, yet we have to be conscious of, uh, of experience. Also, there's a distinction between this situation and that of the two Michaels. In the case of the two Michaels, it was China's reaction to Canada arresting one of theirs, Meng Wanzhou. This is not the case here. So I would say, by and large, Canadians are not necessarily in danger, but they're not risk-free neither, given China's, uh, China's experience. Uh, in retaliating against uh, foreign countries. Further, China is currently clamping down on foreign firms in various ways. Uh, they've raided some offices, they've arrested some local staff, they've put in place exit bans. So it might be that at some point in time, some Canadians uh, may feel the heat in, uh, in China. Mm -hmm. Now, I I'm wondering how China views this country. And, and I ask that because here we have uh, this response, a, a warning that m more may come. And I wonder about Beijing's view of Canada. There are countries that Beijing looks at and essentially sees as vassal states of the PRC, uh, countries whose sovereignty Beijing ignores. How does the PRC view this country? Do they think that we are able to be pushed around? I would venture to say the following. Uh, they see us, I would think, as a weak middle power, yet as a useful economic partner, and third, as a close ally to the United States, if not a vassal to the United States. I think that that's essentially how they see us. In terms of economic links, uh, we have things of interest here for China, natural resources, technology, and so on. And further, our economy is closely integrated with that of the U.S., so that is of interest to, uh, to China. And to, you know, to put things in a, in, a, in a historical perspective as well, you know, China and Canada used to have a rather positive relationship. And I was part of that for a number of years, you know, going back to, uh, well, before me, going back to uh, our shipments of wheat during the famine, to early diplomatic recognition and so on. China used to respect us. But it's definitely not the case anymore. And they feel that, yes, they can push us around just like they're pushing around 
uh, other countries around the planet. So what can Canada do then? Uh, beyond the, this one case with, with Michael Chong, we certainly know other uh, Chinese diaspora in this country have complained uh, about getting threats or feeling that they're not safe in this country. So what can Canada actually do to counter the PRC's meddling into Canadian affairs? Well, the, the first simple thing to say is that Canada should decide to act. We've known for years that China conducts operations in Canada which are totally inappropriate or if not illegal. And yet we've let that happen in plain sight for years. And, uh, and you know, for, for the last few months, we've heard the government say, oh, well, we're sort of aware, but, uh, you know, we've conducted reports and investigations and we created a committee and so on. But until very recently, we had seen no real action. The only two pieces of action we've seen more recently are first, this expulsion of a, of a Chinese diplomat. And uh, secondly, we've been told that the RCMP has finally closed the, uh, the Chinese police stations, although we don't have the details. But that is uh, as, of, uh, as of recently, until recently, we've just let things happen. So I think that we need to be much more proactive when we see things that are inappropriate well, our security services, our police, our politicians should be there on the ground to prevent things from, from happening. I think that is first and foremost uh, what should be our overall approach. There's a lot of talk about a foreign agent's registry. I think that that would be relevant, although I have to admit it is a little bit complicated, but it would be one instrument amongst various that we could use. And what about a public inquiry? As you know, that is being debated right now. Uh, I possibly being considered by, by David Johnston, the former governor general, as he looks into foreign interference. Would a public inquiry help, at the very least, to make sure that every Canadian comes to know the actions of the PRC in this country? Well, I think that for sure we need a full inquiry which will go in depth about the activities of China and other countries as well, and which also goes in depth in terms of what the Canadian government has done or has not done, and leading, of course, to what we should do in the future. Now, there's a lot of talk about the possibility, uh, a lot of demand, actually, for this inquiry to be public. At this stage, it is probably the way to go because Canadians desire, Canadians had a thirst for, for knowledge uh, on that file, and they want to know uh, the state, uh, state of the situation. So I'm, uh, if I had to bet at this point in time, I would say that Mr. Johnston, when he comes out uh, later this month, will probably recommend a public inquiry. But public or not, the important thing is that it goes in depth and that afterwards this information should be communicated to Canadians, respecting, of course, some limits in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, secrecy and so on. But the bulk of the information should go to Canadians. And I take example amongst others on Australia, which has taken a much more proactive approach in terms of communicating with its public on what it is doing in terms of interference. Henri-Paul Nomadin, thank you very much for the time today. Really appreciate it. Pleasure.